Welcome to Sengoku Daimyo's Chronicles of Japan. My name is Joshua, and this is episode 101, Pawns, Peaches, and Thunder Gods. First off, a big thanks to Red and Ryan for helping to support the site and our show. If you'd like to join them, we'll have more information at the end of the episode, or check out our website at sengokudaimyo.com. When last we left off, we were going through some of the more random events that happened in the reign of Kashiki Ahime, aka Suiko Tenno. And we're going to continue with that this episode, touching on some of the things that happened in the latter part of her reign, starting in about 613 and going from there. Some of this is more exciting than others. I'll try to hit the high points, but some of this will be familiar if you've been listening along. For example, one of the thrilling things we'll start with, at least if you're a frog, is the building of ponds. In the winter of 613, we're told that the ponds of Waki no Kami, Unebi, and Wani were constructed. We've seen the construction of ponds since at least the time of Mimaki Iribiko, aka Sujin Tenno, the purported first sovereign from around the probable time of Queen Himiko. The exact nature of these ponds doesn't seem to be known, but one theory is that they are for irrigation of rice paddies in places where the water wasn't consistently sufficient for everyone's needs. A pond would allow for water to be gathered up throughout the year and then released when it was needed for the rice paddies, and more ponds would have indicated the opening of more fields, indicating continued growth. Ponds also had other uses, however, including breeding fish and they were a habitat for birds, so this would also help encourage hunting and fishing. Finally, the ponds were public utilities, and part of the way the court flexed their power as they raised levies for the ponds' construction. We might also say something about the way they indicated a certain amount of control over the land, but of course, most of these ponds are in the Nara Basin and Kawachi regions, so it doesn't really tell us a whole lot more than we already know about the centralized control that was there. Now, they were important enough, however, that by the 8th century, the creation of these ponds was still being tracked and attributed to specific rulers. If you're wondering what it might have been like to travel around in this period of Japan, you might be interested in the fact that, in the same line about the ponds, we're also told that a highway was built from Asuka to Naniwa. This is believed to be the path of the ancient Takeuchi Kaido in Kawachi, which some of the literature claims is the oldest official road in Japan. This road connects to the Yokooji in Nara, which links to the modern city of Sakai near Osaka with the city of Katsuraki, and presumably it then connected with other paths down to Asuka. I suspect that the official qualifier here is there because we have evidence of when it was made, whereas other roads and highways, such as the old highway along the foot of the mountains on the eastern edge of the Nara Basin, are perhaps even more ancient, but are simply mentioned without evidence of how or when they were created. They may have been more organic footpaths that came to be heavily traveled, or just created with no record of who and when. This new highway was notable for connecting the port of Naniwa to the current capital and to the newly built temples in the Asuka area as well. These temples were new institutions but they were also fairly permanent structures, unlike even the palace buildings, which were still expected to be rebuilt each reign. Of course, they could be moved, and were in later periods, but that was going to take some doing. That said, there were other permanent structures and religious sites. Heck, many of the kami were associated with mountains, and you couldn't exactly move those, though they did have the ability to build sacred spaces elsewhere and bring the kami to them, so you weren't exactly tied to the physical geography. And there were the giant Kofun, but I'm not sure how often people were going to the Kofun to worship the ancient kings and other elites, other than perhaps family members paying their respects. Temple had learning and teaching and sermons and other things going on pretty regularly. The building of a highway to the capital alone would probably have been an interesting flex, since the next sovereign could just move somewhere else entirely, but the temples were intended to be relatively permanent institutions as far as I can tell, so even if the capital did move, the fact that there was a road there was probably going to be a big boon to that area and to the use of the temples. Of course, it 
probably didn't hurt that this area was also a Soga stronghold, so at least the Soga family would continue to benefit, which may have gone into some of the political calculus there. It was also going to help with envoys going to and from the continent. And that leads us along to the next item of note about Kashiki Ahime's reign. Sure enough, in the sixth month of the following year, Inugami no Kimi no Mitatsuki and Yatabe no Miyatsuko were sent on a new embassy to the Sui court. By the way, quick note on these two. Inugami no Mitatsuki is given the kabane of Kimi. If you recall, the sovereign is O Kimi or Great Kimi, and so Kimi is thought to have been a relatively important title, possibly referring to a high-ranking family that held sway outside of the immediate lands of Yamato at one point, and Yatabe is given to us as Miyatsuko, also generally referring to one of the higher ranks of nobility under the Kabane system, though not necessarily the inner court families of the Omi and the Muraji. It's unclear whether those Kabane were in use by those families at that time, but it does indicate that the families were important, at least by the time the chronicles were being written. Now, an ancestor of the Inugami first shows up in the reign of Okinaga Tarashihime, aka Jingu Kogo, which is interesting as there are some who claim that the stories of that reign really solidified around the time of Kashiki Ahime, which is to say the current reign, Suiko Tenno. We'll get more into that in a future episode, but for now we can note that the Inugami family doesn't really seem to show up in any of the reigns after Jingu Kogo until this one. And from here on out, we see them as one of the regular interlocutors with the continent, whether the Sui, Tang, or on the Korean Peninsula. Given all that Okinaga Tarashihime has connections with the continent, there may be a little bit more to that. Now, the Yatabe are much more enigmatic. Other than this entry, we don't have a lot that I could see. I mean, there is an ancestor, Takemoto Sumi, mentioned in the reign of Imaki Iribiko, aka Sujin Tenno, and there's some reasonable thought that they may have been set up for the maintenance of Princess Yata, the wife of O Sazaki no Mikoto, aka Nintoku Tenno. But I don't see any clear indication one way or the other. They aren't really mentioned again except as a family during the late 7th century. These two, Inugami no Mitatsuki and the unnamed envoy of the Yatabe family, would return a year later, bringing with them an envoy from Bekje. Now Later in the year, they would throw the envoy an elaborate feast. We're not given much else, but seems like relations were good. Now, Shortly after that feast for the Bekje envoy, the monk Heja, or Eiji in the Japanese reading, returned to his home in Goguryeo. Hyeja had been one of the teachers of none other than Prince Umayado, a.k.a. Shoutoku Taishi himself, and the two are said to have shared a special bond. Shoutoku Taishi eventually became Hyeja's equal, and it's said that they both discussed Buddhist teachings and philosophy together, with Hyeja appreciating Shoutoku Taishi's unique insights. When Prince Umayado eventually passed at an all-too-early age, the news reached Hyeja on the peninsula, and he held a special feast in his student-turned-peer's honor. They say that he then predicted his own death one year later on the anniversary of Shotoku Taishi's own passing. But that was still to come. For now, you could say that everything was peachy. And so they did. Sort of. In the next item of note. What they actually said was that in the first month of 616, at the beginning of spring, the peach and plum trees bore fruit, which may seem an odd thing to comment on. However, peach and plum trees flowering or fruiting would be something that the chroniclers commented on for at least the next two reigns, as well as in the reign of Oama, aka Temmu Tenno, in the latter part of the 7th century. It's possible that they were commenting on how much they were fruiting out of season. The peach, or momo in Japanese, blossoms typically between late March and mid-April. And this is around the same time as the plum, which in this case is the sumomo rather than the ume plum, which is sometimes called a Japanese apricot. Momo and sumomo would blossom towards the start of spring, and so it might be possible for them to blossom around the first month of the new year, especially if that was a little later than it might be today. But highly unlikely that they would be fruiting. 
Now, assuming that they're talking about the blossoms and some later accounts explicitly call out the flowers instead, it may have indicated a particularly warm winter or an early spring season that year. It's also possible that the chroniclers were off on the dates and times and so may have made a couple of mistakes. It is also possible they were just recounting an odd event. Having the peach trees and plum trees fruit or blossom at the obviously wrong time would likely have generated some concern and thus be worthy of noting down as an omen of some kind or at least something to go into the almanac. It is also possible that this is part of a stock phrase that we use to indicate something else, like the start of spring, or as I said, a good or bad omen. Peaches were thought to keep away evil spirits, and it was said that they were the fruit of immortality in the western paradise of the Queen Mother of the West. Peaches are often common decorations on Buddhist temples as well, going back to the same stories about warding off evil and longevity. Whatever the reason, the blooming and fruiting of peach and plum trees was apparently particularly important to the chroniclers for this period, for whatever reason. Beyond the talk of peaches in 616, there was something else, something fairly simple but also important. Men from the island of Yaku arrived as immigrants. This is the first mention we really have of Yaku Island, and if you haven't heard of it, I wouldn't blame you. It is an island south of modern Kagoshima, off the southern tip of Kyushu, and just west of another famous island, that of Tanegashima. Yakushima today is known for its status as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so classified for its incredible natural beauty. It's home to some truly ancient cedars, with some thought to date back as far as 2300 years ago well into the Yayoi era. It is mentioned in the Nihon Shoki as well as Sui Dynasty records and in numerous other travel accounts since. We have evidence of human activity going back at least 17,000 years ago, so before even the Jomon era, though the earliest evidence of habitation on the island is more like 6,000 years ago, about 500 to 1,000 years after the famous Akahoya eruption, which devastated Kyushu, and which we discussed back in episode 4. Yakushima would also have been devastated, situated as it is just south of the Kikai caldera, and it was likely devastated by pyroclastic flows along with its neighboring islands. Since then, however, it was populated by people that were now, in the 7th century, making contact with the people of Yamato perhaps indicating that Yamato had even further expanded its reach. Over the course of the year 616, the Chronicles note several groups of immigrants from Yakushima. First was a group of three men who came as immigrants in the third month. Then seven more arrived two months later, and two months after that you had a group of 20 show up. They were all settled together in a place called Enoi. It isn't exactly clear where this is. Some sources suggest they came to the Dazaifu in Kyushu and so were settled somewhere on Kyushu, possibly in the south of the island. There's also a connection with the name Enui coming out of Mino in the form of the Enui family, which the Sendai Kuji Hongi says was an offshoot of the Mononobe. Wherever they ended up, they stayed there for the rest of their lives. And we aren't done with Yaku Island, though. Four years later, we're told that two men of Yaku were cast away, which I suspect means banished to the island of Izu, or Izunoshima. Once again, we're left wondering exactly where that is, though it may refer not to an island, at least not entirely, but to Izu no Kuni and the land of Izu on the Izu Peninsula. Aston suggests that perhaps at this time, Shima didn't mean just an island, but any place that was mostly surrounded by water, including a peninsula like Izu could also mean one of the nearby islands, such as Oshima, the largest of the islands to the east of the Izu Peninsula. Nine years later, in the reign of the succeeding sovereign, Yamato sent an envoy, Tanabe no Muraji, to the island of Yaku. I suspect that this was part of making the island an official part of the country. Records of the island fall off for a bit, but it does get mentioned along with the name marine Tanegashima in the reign of Temmu Tenno in the latter part of the 7th century. To be fair, the Nihon Shoki only continues until 696, but we do continue to see them in the Shoku Nihongi, the continuation of the court historical records. 
Sure, Yakushima was probably never going to be a huge story from a political perspective, but it does give us some insight into just how far Yamato's influence reached at this point. Going back to the record, we have another fruit-related account. This time, it is about an enormous gourd coming out of Izumo. One as big as a... well, we aren't exactly sure. The character they use is read Khan, and today often refers to aluminum cans and the like, but that, as you may have guessed, is a relatively recent meaning. In the 7th and 8th century, it was probably something more like pole, and may have meant an earthenware pot for storing alcohol, like the Greek amphorae, or it may have been in reference to a kind of musical instrument. Either way, we're talking a pretty good-sized gourd. Not sure if it would take a ribbon in some of today's largest pumpkin contests, but still impressive for the time. Now, moving beyond the state fair category of entries, we come to one of my favorite events. It takes place, we are told, in 618, when Kawabe no Omi was sent to the land of Aki to build ships. He went with his crews up into the mountains to fell timber when he met with something extraordinary, which was still being depicted in paintings centuries later although most people probably haven't heard the story. Now, the name Kawabe first shows up as the location of the Miyake, or royal granaries and administrative centers, set up south of Yamato on the peninsula in the land of Ki in about 535. The first record of a person by the name, however, is less than auspicious. It was the assistant general, Kawabe no Nihi, who is panned by the chroniclers for his actions during the reign of Ame Kuniyoshi. As we discussed in episode 82, Kawabe snatched defeat from the jaws of victory due to his lack of military expertise. This next mention of a Kawabe family member is coming a good many years later, but the family does seem to have recovered somewhat. Kawabe no Omi no Nezu would be appointed a general several years later, and that could be the same Kawabe no Omi from this story, as there was only about seven or so years between events. Furthermore, members of the family would find themselves in the middle of some of the most impactful events of the court, indicating their high status. Multiple family members would be remembered and memorialized in the histories over the rest of the century, whether for better or for ill. Which makes it a little interesting to me that the story of the Kawabe family shipbuilder doesn't actually give us a personal name of any kind. Now, later interpretations of this particular story would say that this Kawabe no Omi was out building ships on the orders of Prince Sho Tokutaishi himself, though the Nihon Shoki would seem to indicate that he was out there instead at the behest of the sovereign, Kashiki Ahime. Of course, given what the Nihon Shoki has to say about Sho Tokutaishi's contributions to running the government, it could be either one. Regardless of who sent him, he had a job to do. He searched through the forest and he found suitable trees for the timber he needed. In all likelihood, he was looking for large, straight trees which would have good grain and not so many knots to cause problems. I suspect that the older trees were likely preferable for the task. Having found what he was looking for, he marked it, and then they began to chop down the marked trees. Suddenly, a man appeared, a stranger, or perhaps just a local coming to see what the fuss was all about. He warned Kawabi no Omi and his men that the tree they had marked was a thunder tree, and it shouldn't be cut. To this, Kawabe no Omi asked, Shall even the Thunder God disobey the royal commands? However, he didn't just barrel on with the task. Instead, he and his men started by offering mitegura, offerings of cloth. This was likely done to appease any spirits before the crew got started, and I wonder if this was something exceptional, or perhaps something that people regularly did, especially when you were taking large, older trees. It isn't clear, but an 8th century crowd no doubt understood the significance. Once they had finished providing recompense to the kami, they went about their task. Then, out of nowhere, it began to rain. As the water poured down from the sky, thunder and lightning came crashing down. Apparently, the offering had not been accepted, and the kami was now quite angry. While his men sought shelter, Kawabe no Omi drew out his iron sword and held it aloft, crying out to the angry Kami, O Kami of Thunder, do not harm these men. I am the one that you want. 
So saying, sword held aloft in the midst of this unexpected thunderstorm, he stood there, watching the roiling clouds and waiting. Ten times the lightning flashed and crashed around them, the thunder rolling each time. One can only imagine the sight as Kawabi no Omi stood there, wind whipping his hair and his clothes as he challenged the storm. And yet, try as it might, the thunderous lightning did not strike Kawabe no Omi. And finally, the lightning stopped, and Kawabe no Omi was still unharmed. As the men came out of hiding, they noticed a disturbance. Above them, there was a movement, and the men saw the strangest thing. Up in the branches of the tree, there was a small fish. Near as anyone could reckon, the god had turned visible, taking on the form of a fish, and so Kawabi no Omi caught the fish and burnt it. After that, they were able to safely harvest the rest of the timber and build the ships. While we may have some doubts as to the veracity of the story, or may even wonder if a particularly violent storm hadn't picked up a fish from a nearby water source, an event that has been known to happen, it still holds some clues about how the people at the time thought and how they believed the world worked. Even today, older trees and even rocks are sometimes thought to house spirits. In some cases, shrines are built up and people will worship the spirit of a particularly tree or rock, so it isn't so far-fetched to think that they were harvesting ancient trees that were believed by locals to contain some kind of spirit, which, if aroused, could bring serious harm to Kawabe no Omi and his men. This is probably why they made their offering in the first place, hoping that would be enough to placate the spirit. At the same time, we see them drawing on the power of the sovereign, who isn't even present. Kawabe no Omi's protection is that he is following the sovereign's commands, and that alone is his shield. Heck, he even goes so far as to raise up his sword. I know we're still an eon from Ben Franklin and his kite, but I'm pretty sure that people had figured out certain things about lightning beyond just don't be out in it. Namely, don't wave around pointy metal things in the middle of a storm. As for the symbolism of the kami turning into a fish, well, who knows just how kami think about these things. They don't always do things that make sense, not to us mortals anyway. For instance, there's one story where a man prayed for a boat and the kami gave him one, but put it on top of a nearby mountain instead of in the lake. Maybe they just weren't that accurate, or maybe they didn't quite get how the visible world works sometimes. It's also possible that the kami turned itself into a helpless fish on purpose, as a sign that it was giving up, since it clearly had not been able to best Kawabe no Omi, and the burning of the fish may have also had some significance. Whatever the reason, the boats were built, and not even the kami could defy the will of the sovereign. Now, there were a few other things that happened the following year, more strange and bizarre happenstances. The first was that on the fourth day of the fourth month, there came a report of a creature shaped like a man in the Kamo River in Aomi. And who knows what it was? Perhaps it was some kind of kappa or other river spirit. Or perhaps it was just some stranger skinny dipping and you just really put everyone off. Or maybe it was just a weird log viewed from the wrong angle. Whatever the reason, the people, well... They didn't quite like it, and Aston notes that this was probably considered an inauspicious omen. Then, in the 7th century, a fisherman from the land of Setsu caught something in one of the man-made canals, or horie, in the area of modern Osaka. The creature he caught was part fish and part man, or so we're told. Perhaps it's the same creature that had been seen three months earlier further upriver, like some kind of ancient Yamato mermaid. What exactly did it mean, though? Certainly it seems a strange occurrence, but was it considered good or bad omen, or was it just weird or strange? Frankly, did it even happen? Now the following year, there was a strange shape in the sky. Chroniclers say it was red, shaped like a rooster tail, and over a rod or about ten feet or so in length. I mean, perhaps it was just a rogue cloud being kissed by the red light of the rising or setting sun. Or perhaps it was something else entirely. These were the kinds of things that were likely seen as omens, though whether a good omen or a bad omen, not quite sure how you could say. I mean, a fish man in the rivers, a red glowing light in the sky. I suspect it often wouldn't be until later that such things would be pieced together. 
In this case, the omens were likely pretty dire, as in that same year we're told that none other than Prince Umayado, Shotoku Taishi himself, grew ill and passed away. The whole of the realm, we're told, mourned their collective loss. The crown prince of the upper palace, heir to the throne of Yamato, was dead. So yeah, I would say those were some pretty bad omens. Umayado's death would leave a real void. Where there had once been certainty of succession, the land was back in the chaos of wondering what would happen when Kashikiya Hime finally passed away. Would they be returned to a state of civil war for the throne? Well, who could say? And there was more. The continent was also in a state of uncertainty, as only recently the Sui dynasty had been overthrown, and now the new Tang was in its place. In addition, a resurgent Shilla on the Korean peninsula was getting ever more bold and sure of its own power. There were many things to be concerned about. But let's not leave it on such a dire note. We can cover all of that in future episodes. We really don't have time to go through all of it here, but there is one other story I'd like to leave you with, at least for now. You see, a little earlier that year, the same year that Umayado passed away, the Yamato court had finished covering the tomb of Hinokuma with pebbles. Now, although the Kofun today are often overgrown and seem as much like wooded hills as anything else, back in the day there would have been no mistaking their man-made origins. The ground was cleared and tamped down into place. The sides rose in distinct terraces, and the surface was covered in stones. Around it would be the clay and wood haniwa. Families were employed to keep the kofun and likely refresh them from time to time. In the case of Hinokuma, recall that earlier in the year, Kitashi Hime, Kashikiya Hime's mother, had been reinterred there with her husband. This was likely further ceremonies for her, perhaps the culmination of years of work on the tomb. We're also told that the earth was piled up onto a hill, and each family erected a wooden pillar. One official, Yamato no Aya no Saka no Ue no Atai, decided to go all out. You know, maybe he didn't get the memo, or maybe he thought he would make a name for himself. Either way, he brought in the largest pillar, larger than any of the other family heads that were present. And, well, he did make a name for himself, though perhaps not the name he wanted. That name was Ohashira no Atai, or the Atai of the Giant Pillar. Probably not exactly what he was going for, but there you have it. By the way, if you recognize that name, Sakano Ue, then you may have noticed that yes, this is likely an ancestor of the famous Sakano Ue no Tamura Maro, a famous warrior of the late Nara and early Heian periods, and the second person ever to carry the title of Sei Taishogun. But that's still over a century and a half away. For now, in the coming episodes, we'll finish up with the reign of Kashikiya Hime, perhaps touch briefly on what was happening on the continent, and continue on as we make our way through the latter part of the 7th century. Until then, I want to thank you for listening. Thank you again for all of your support. If you like what we're doing, please tell your friends and feel free to rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you feel the need to do more and want to help us out, we have information on how you can donate on Patreon or through our coffee site, ko-fi.com slash sengokudaimyo or find links over at our main website sengokudaimyo.com slash podcast where we'll have some more discussion on topics from this episode. Also feel free to tweet at us at at Sengoku Podcast or reach out to our Sengoku Daimyo Facebook page. You can also email us at the Sengoku Daimyo at gmail.com. Thank you also to Ellen for her work in editing the podcast. And that's all for now. Thank you again, and I'll see you next episode on Sengoku Daimyo's Chronicles of Japan.